hermoso. Hola, mi gente linda, and welcome to Panavision, the Todo Soflo podcast that brings you all local stories, news, and music with your thriving and alive hosts, Annette y Clary, the co-founders of Panamia Club. Yes, thanks, Annette. Panamia Club is a collective that's You're making welcome. supporting local creatives and entrepreneurs as easy as crying during this past super blue moon, super in cold Pisces. moon in Pisces, no less. Yeah. Um, so every episode, we're going to bring you a locally based band to discuss what they're doing in their community. And then we'll also highlight a new artist that is working on some creative stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. And today we will be speaking with uh, Sunai to talk about her their experience creating, editing and producing Miami's new alternative food magazine, Underbelly. And then later we're going to chat with your friend and my friend also, Sifania of <laughs> Maroon Isles <laughs> Production about their experience with the local theater scene and their upcoming events. You recently went to one of their shows, right? Yes, I saw Jealousy at Thank You Miami. It was an immersive dinner experience. And for me, I, it was like honestly one of the most unique and really cool um, experiences in Miami. I've never been to something like that. Um, and, and it was awesome. It, it was like, it was like I was watching a telenovela set in Miami. It was really, really cool. <laughs> that sounds really yes. interesting. And we'll talk more about it with him later. <laughs> All right, so do you want to get into the panas? Do you want to tell us about the new panas? Yes, uh -huh. yes, of course. So we are starting with the creatives. So there's there's a lot because, you know, a lot of people have been joining the directory. First up, we have Kat, a.k.a. at Sunflare3Es underscore. Uh, so she was actually one of the actresses at this um, event that I'm telling you about in Jealousy. So she is an actress that is is a part of the of um, our guests theater company and we have two more after that so we have Gio Ma Giovanni Marin uh, he it's for me he was kind of like one of the the main characters and also a tremendous actor uh, after that we have Mel Toi so he is a projector <laughs> proyector musical Más expresiones visuales. Yes, we actually got a chance to see them live yeah. uh, two Saturdays ago. They performed with Spanglish City and also Máquina del Flow. So it was an all pana, all pana concert. All pana concert. Show. And it was, it was honestly, I loved the music. Yeah, I, it was great. I went up after the show and I told him that. And he signed up to become a pana right after. True story. <laughs> Love then that. we have so rec one so a cuban graffiti artist we have public energy um or duality so they are actually a friend of miami community radio and a resident um so uh create what i'm sorry i lost my place a visual label to help visual artists roll out and brand their projects to have broader reach then we have zethos a miramar based musical artist lisandra a local tattoo artist focused on nostalgic designs mel de miami a creative director ind interdisciplinary artist and native miamian that's what's up then we have buco boys a filipino band which they're I'm so pretty cute. excited about. I love them. Yeah, they're so cute. I love cute. them. I can't wait to hear more of their music. We have Matthew Stember, uh, or it's Matt Stem Photography, a local photographer. We have Torna Love, an uh, Ecuadorian musician, and that's, that's it for creatives. Awesome. We also have a couple of really interesting organizations sign up. So first off is finally Comedor Azul. Yes. yes, love them. If you haven't gotten a chance <laughs> to go to their events, they're really, really sweet. Um, they reintroduce traditional foods through decolonization of recipes and the sharing of these meals. So we actually got a chance to go to one of their events. And it's really cool. They bring out, you know, what do they have? Blue corn. Tortillas. They had blue corn tortillas. They had, they had like ooh, a guisado. ceviche. Oh my gosh, an Ecuadorian ceviche que it te mueras. So like, good. <gasps> so good. Uh, actually, we had a conversation with Sunai there during that event, which was incredible. Yes. Um, um, we also have Achiever City. They're an independent record label and traveling studio for all your rec record needs. So like they also focus on up and coming local um, Latino uh, musicians. So then we also have Miami Film Lab. They're super cool. They put on a monthly um, film festival, like film screening for all local um, film, you know, people in the film industry. They're a nonprofit production company supporting local filmmakers. Um, and then lastly, we have Find the Click. So I actually found these people um, over at 
uh, Tripping Animals. Love yeah. that. And they host events that invite you to connect with your creativity and your art. So they have community art supplies and whatnot, and you can go and be creative. I love that. I love that. Um, it's genuinely like really cool to see organizations like that just kind of randomly distributed around Miami. Like you're going to a brewery to hang out and then now you also have the opportunity to like create while you're there. Yes. So next up we have a couple of small businesses. We, we have Josh's Pizza, freshly made artisanal pizza. Yum. Delicious. And we have Muna Luna Skincare Studio, holistic skincare studio that uses all clean and non-toxic ingredients. You know what? I, I might need to update my skincare regimen. So you got too much sun? Too much? No, not enough sun. I want no. more sun. <laughs> I'm talking about I don't know. Like you get stressed and then you have like little pepitas on your face and you need to like exfoliate. Hydration, like I just <laughs> hydration. That's all. Yeah. Um, so now we're moving on to mapas. So these are businesses that have physical locations. We're always looking for venues, restaurants, those types of places that can host events and whatnot. So. I'm really excited about this. We have Lost City Brewery. Yeah, they're over in North Miami, um, a local local brewery, a local um, Hispanic-owned brewery. Yeah, which so is really cool. Definitely check them out. Yeah, they're super great. They have a, a couple of great drinks. Um, we also have Nurture Miami. They're a cooperative-style flex space available to artists and wellness practitioners of all kinds for rent. So. Um, and then we also have Mellow Grapes, which is a fine wine and craft beer bar serving homemade bites and incredible desserts. Yes. And we're actually going to go check them out this week on Wednesday. Shout out to them. Yeah. Uh, I'm so excited yeah, to now we go have to the w uh, wine tasting. Taking your mom there. Yeah. It's going to be my mom's birthday, and I'm going to take her to the wine tasting at Mellow Grapes and Kendall. I think it will be good. I think I it, I think it she, be I incredible. Think she'll, I think she'll enjoy it. Yeah. It, they lot. look really sweet. Yeah. So. Yeah. So anyway, and that puts us at 370 members. Yay. So <laughs> thank you so much to everyone who has joined. It's really exciting to see our community grow, um, but we want to catch them all. So if you are a small business catch owner, all. yep, um, a creative in Broward, um, anywhere in South Florida, please DM us and join our community. It's free to join. All you got to do is fill out a form. Um, and also thanks to our sponsor, Rogue Apothecary, for supporting us on this podcast. They are uh, helping us teleprompt, so kisses. Yes. So it's important to stay educated about what's going on with our banas, of course, and our local community. Luckily, Gladi and I are here to, here to catch you up on lo que está pasando in South Florida in our segment, Meanwhile in SoFlo. Oh, I thought you were going to switch it Okay. <laughs> So first off, we have what's happening in our community. So uh, Rogue Apothecary, our sponsor, uh, presents 420 in the fall, and it starts promptly at 420 p.m. on September 16th, so not 420, September 16th at 420 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at Lauder Ale. So I don't know if y'all have ever been there, but it is a nice little brewery like right next to the Fort Lauderdale airport and it's locally owned. So really cool spot. There'll be two rolling sessions and an Artie Toke workshop, with, which if you guys aren't aware of Artie Toke, I've actually taught Artie Toke a couple of times, but it's basically an art session where you can hang out and then, you know, smoke a little bit and then also just like create art and have a good time. Yeah, so I have two events for you happening tonight, all right? The tonight. first one tonight, <laughs> starting with the first one at 7 p.m., so right after this podcast. Um, there is an event called Women in Flux, hosted by the Miami Art Society. So it's going to be a night of performance art and an exploration of the creative narratives that women bring to the forefront. That sounds super cool. So cool. And we I might, I, yeah, we, yeah, we're going to I want to go there. Boop, wanna and then by. afterwards, ding, 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 um, Corruption MIA is hosting an event, and one of our new panas and long-term friend, SDRV, that's sitting over there checking audio, <laughs> yes. yes, they're going to be DJing at this event, so definitely check it out. It starts at 11 p.m., um, so more for the night owls out there. Dress code is strictly enforced, but it's very, very fun, so definitely go out, show out be a good time. Yes. And then um, our Pana, cool news, our Pana, Public Enemy, and Boombox are presenting uh, Baltimore Banger, which is basically like sort of this mesh collab between Miami's finest and Mo Baltimore's brightest uh, to bring you the sounds of 410 and 305 under one roof. 
Ooh. So I I really like the sound of that event. I think honestly it's gonna be that really fun. interesting. That sounds fun because it's it's like you know two completely different scenes that they're meshing together. I love when that happens. Oh, and it's gonna happen. I almost forgot. <laughs> September twenty third at domicile. Okay, so <laughs> get those tickets. <laughs> yes, and then lastly tomorrow there's another event that SDRV is uh, performing at. Oh, shall I say so? Three points and club space presents Andrew Music Club at Lot Eleven. Um, nice. So if you haven't been to that venue, it's a really cool space. Um, it's a skate park, it's a like skate under park. Uh, the Underpass? highway. Yeah, yeah, under the highway. Yeah, it's super fun, great venue, um, and they're gonna be there from four to eleven. So to cure your Sunday blues. Absolutely. And then we have in Incl- Oh, by the way, yeah, like tomorrow, like on Sunday. Yeah. On Sunday. And which is even better because Monday is Labor Day. Oh. So I didn't you can realize. stay out as yes. late as y'all want is, no my, blues, is my point. Just happiness. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in front of me at Club News, we, uh, so something really cool on October 7th, uh, Serotonin Dippity is going to be one of the first events that we have ever sponsored. And uh, it's, it's, go- it's actually the show of one of our former guests on the podcast, Folktale San Pedro. So Folktale San Pedro is uh, having the show with a few other artists, like uh, Pigeon Society is going to be there, Shiva is going to be there. Viper Sounds. Viper <coughs> Sounds is going to be there. Mad Woman. Mad Woman. I can't name everybody, but... Uh, we are going to be doing something really cool for the very first time. We're going to have a Panavision pop-up. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, we are going to be the, the newscasters. Yeah, we're going to be interviewing them You're after their sets. We're going to be sets. interviewing after their sets. So we're going to be like the reporters at the end of the music sets and be like, how, how did it go for you on stage? It went so good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you know professionals definitely get your (laughs) tickets uh october 7th yes say hi to us and then also so we have exciting news our team here at panamia club is growing and we love to see that we we love to receive help we love to continue to grow um annette and i can't do everything so we just are so blessed especially especially web things Uh, okay yeah so (laughs) we have three new web developers that are helping us with the uh, website. Um, so big shout out to Brian Torres, yes. Felix, and Michael. Yes. You know who you are. Thank you guys so, so very much. We had our first meeting with them yesterday. It went great. And so we hope to have like stuff to show you yes. really soon. Very soon. So in, like those of you that are asking us like, oh, when is the directory coming up? Um, much sooner now yeah. that we have five whole people working on it. So... <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, we, we can't wait to see like the stuff that comes out of that. So then we have on September the 23rd, 20, a 24th, ooh, 24th, yeah, September 24th on a Sunday, new show alert, uh, El Igor y sus panas. So this is going to be a collaborative show with Panamia Club and El Igor. We are going to have six acts, including two D- DJs, as well as a short skit brought to you by Stefania of Maroon Isle Productions. If that name sounds familiar to you, is because we are going to be talking to Stefania right here on this episode a little bit later. Yes. And more details to come on Igor's birthday, which is September 6th, same day as my mom's birthday. This Wednesday. It's not pertinent but i just wanted to say it <laughs> happy birthday mom yay and right. Igor. and yeah and Igor. uh we're also really excited because we have a broadcast channel on youtube so if you're wondering where is it that this content lands it's there where does it go? it's where does it go once it gets recorded and it doesn't show up on on instagram it's because it's on our youtube um subscribe and also to our on youtube subscribe to the youtube also it lands on spotify so in case for people who are subscribe out there, to our spotify yeah so while you're stuck in traffic you can listen to us talk <laughs> to cool really really cool people yeah 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 so if you really like the sound of our voices and just want to listen to it all the time yeah there's YouTube there's content for you there's platforms for you <laughs> So that was Meanwhile in SoFlo. Uh, if you know of any interesting news that you want us to bring up next time, please don't hesitate to DM us. And yeah. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, please send us your news next time. Or if not, we just we are literally just scrolling Instagram. So uh, send us your events so yep. we can promote you. Yep, yep, yep. So, so now that we're all caught up with community things. Now that we're all caught up, we're going to bring on 
our very exciting guest, Swan A of Underbelly. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome, my love. Welcome, welcome. Oh my gosh, love your nails. So right? cool. So cool. <laughs> yeah, you just DM them to Yeah. <laughs> I just DM them the <laughs> invite of, hey, do you want to join Panamia Club? This is how we get so many panas. We're yeah. just like, who are you using? Who do you go to? Yeah. yeah. So that's a shout out to you. If you want to start sending us local profiles, we'll hit them up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, I love your shirt. Can you show, look at this incredible shirt, incredible design. Uh, in Shibari. I feel like it's a good representation of my brand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally see it. Food totally and art. Food and art. So, so cool. I actually wanted to ask you because um, you make a, a very, like, kind of like, I think um, the, the main description of Underbelly is, like, uh, for the alternative art scene. Digo, alternative food scene. Yeah. So... I mean, that's that's why I brought it up, because like usually when you think of alternative, you're like, oh, art or music, right. but you're talking about food. So what does alternative food mean? Oh, great question. Um, so for me, alternative food is food that you don't necessarily see in the mainstream too much. So it's maybe like you drive by a road and you pass by that restaurant like a million times. You never go in unless a blog talks about it. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's what alternative food is, um, but also I'm going in an alternative perspective to the food because I feel like Miami food scene is very focused on reviews, but we Mm. don't really get to know the people who are cooking the food. Mm. So I'm also focusing on that alternative side of food culture here where we get to know the people who are actually making your food. That's so cool. So it's not, food is not just like the end product. It's also the ingredients. It's the people that are working on it. Exactly. It's not just your own perspective on how the food is. It's also like what was behind, you know, the food and, and the, the thought process and, you know, the people who like their journey to get to, you know, putting food in your plate. That, that's really interesting because we were just like talking about Comedor Azul. And yeah. it's very, it seems like you guys are kind of kindred spirits in the sense of mm. like that Comedor Azul is an organization of artists that are trying to create experiences related to food. And their whole point uh, is kind of what you're saying about mm-hmm. like, let's explore the roots, the history, the cultural significance, the people that make the food mm-hmm. and kind of like make it a more holistic experience. Yeah. And it's in a place that's not a restaurant. Yeah. Like, we were literally, like, outside under a tree, a mango tree, under lights, like, sitting on the floor. Like, yeah. that is an alternative space for, for that sort of thing to happen as well. So that's, again, like, something that I like to explore is, like, other alternative ways that people are um, showing their food. So not just in, like, a restaurant format, but in art, in clothes, in anything that food can be expressed. Poetry, that's why my magazine is... It's about food, but you're not going to only find recipes. You'll find uh, paintings, poetry, articles. Like It's just a mix of so many different aspects of food. I actually really liked the, the um, poem on Pitaya. Oh, yeah, that that's my really sister. Nice. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's Aww. so nice. Shout out my sister. <laughs> um, so I think we got a little bit ahead of ourselves. Yeah, just uh, a bit. I'd like to <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And of um, for those of you who don't know Underbelly or don't know you, um, how would you introduce yourselves? Um, well, introducing the magazine, like you said, it is an alternative food magazine. So it's a digital magazine which is great because it's never sold out. I'm not, you know, wasting any kind of paper or anything mm-hmm. like that. It's very accessible. You can take it wherever you go. You have your phone, you have the magazine there to keep you company. Mm-hmm. Um, so the magazine is really just like a blank canvas for Miami locals to show their appreciation and their interpretation of Miami food culture in whatever shape or form that will be, if, whether that be your grandmother's recipe, whether that be a poem. So it, I really want to create that sort of space for anyone to want to convey that in a magazine space, regardless of their experience, regardless of how many followers they have, um, regardless of any experience they might have with the subject, like, I want to give them that sort of blank canvas to have something published. I think that's kind of cool. Like, people don't really have that sort of opportunity, and I want it to be a very, like, open space for people. Mm. Yes, yeah. Um, And and what about you? Oh, me. Uh, Well, my name's Sonai. I'm a Miami local, so I've lived here all my life. Um, I've always been very obsessed with food. Um, it's, you know, I grew up with watching Food Network um, 
and uh, just connecting with people with over food and being obsessed with food, obsessed with like reviewing food since I was like 12, like reviewing like CeCe's pizza, you know what I mean? Like it's just really <laughs> silly stuff. Um, or like making little like food videos at home that like never went anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've always had fun interpreting food in different kind of ways, eating it, making it, drawing it. It's just like been a super big obsession. Um, so outside of that, I mostly work on like making websites as well. So when you said you had a website, I was like, that's great because having a website is so important mm -hmm. for, yeah, for your yeah. brand. Um, but yeah, so that's been like my, mostly my experience. Uh, I guess I can talk about astrology too. Leo sun, Leo moon, Libra rising. Wow. I feel like that's important too. Yeah. Okay. So, uh. The, I think the first time that I saw you as well was emceeing at Witches of Miami's event. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I do you, that, too. You do that, too. <laughs> you, do that too. Yeah. you do a lot. I do a little bit of everything, yeah. I'm Shout a little out bit of to other. Witches, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I saw their episode. They were here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and, a little emceeing. And actually, that episode was when you became a Bana, and they also shouted you out. They were like, our friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So sweet. Yeah, they're really, really great. That, that space has been really cool, too, because um, it's a femme queer community that I love to be around and it's very inspiring we like support each other it's very community based so they're really sweet it's so important like when you're doing this work to have that support you need it yeah yeah you you cannot do it without any support how will you do it yeah I mean it, it's also like both of our businesses are very community based so you have to depend on people yeah and it's nice too because like I like the sort of like bartering sort of bordering and like trading off of things as well. Like, okay, mm -hmm. like you can do the photography for me and then I'll do this for you. And that, right. like I'll help you with your website. That's how I've been able to get so far is like, I'll help you with your website if in exchange for you to do this for me, you know, yeah. like that's been super, super helpful. So like having those sort of skills and like knowing other people's skills and working off of each other, like that's what community is about. Yeah, I totally agree with mm -hmm. that. Um, I did want to ask you, um, because you told us about yourself, you told us about the magazine. <laughs> yeah. How did how does Swanai create Underbelly? Like, what is the story of that? <laughs> and what is your why? <laughs> um, okay, so to be honest, um, the magazine kind of came from so many failed ventures of of creative or food things that I've had, like food blogs or food YouTube, and then like communicating that with the people around me and then telling me kind of like the same thing, like, oh, I wanted to do this food blog or I wanted to paint this or I wanted this poem, but they didn't really have like a place to put it in or mm -hmm. they would try, but it was so hard to get followers or anyone mm -hmm. to see it, so it would just kind of like fizzle off. Mm -hmm. So like speaking to a lot of people and, and, and everyone conveying the same sort of thing, I'm like, hmm, like it'd be cool if we just had like a canvas and like we can just do it. And like I had just uh, got rejected from a from an interview for a, a food blog, um, and like that for me, like I had gotten so far in the interview process, and it was so frustrating because I was like, I wanted it so bad, I wanted it so bad, mm -hmm. that I was like, you know what? This is just enough fuel for me to just do my own thing mm -hmm. and do it how I want to do it. That's why right. I, I talked so much about it being alternative because mm -hmm. I'm like. I don't want any kind of like restrictions. I don't want, I want to be able to do whatever the heck I want. And for anyone as well, like just whatever you feel, whatever comes to you and we can put on a blank canvas, let's do it. Even then I also have a YouTube channel as well. So like if we want to move it to media, like that sort of thing, we can do it as well. I have a Spotify where I have like different um, chefs that. who like, what do you listen to when you're cooking? Like, give me your playlist, you know, so that you can kind of like be in the moment with them. Maybe you're cooking and you can like play something. So it's like, my failed ideas and everyone else's failed ideas. And we're like, you know what? Let's put it into one place and it'll look really cool, all of us together. Like, so, <laughs> <laughs> like, look at us. We're, we're doing it. We're really doing it. That's a really <laughs> funny magazine. description. But it's, it's like, really incredible. It and really it's is. really effective, too, because yeah. <laughs> you're building something together. Exactly. It's a support system that doesn't make you feel alone. Like, it kind of sucks when you're, like, put so much effort into something and then it only gets three likes and then you kind of, like, uh, value yourself to those sort of likes or value yourself to those followers when it's not true your quality does not it's not the same it's not correlated to like how many followers or likes you have um but it's it's hard to get out there if you don't have that like the algorithm just not going to work on your favor and especially mm -hmm. if you're not going to post pictures of like your body or something like that because that's always what goes into the algorithm first yeah. that's why people post like their bodies before they put like a flyer i don't know if you've noticed that like on a slideshow they'll do like what? like the face shot or something like that and then they'll post their flyer because the algorithm won't post if it's just a flyer like it's like a whole shit show the I algorithm have no stuff idea. Yeah. that's so that's, that's so weird crazy. that's kind of creepy that's, that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying it's like of zuckerberg slightly 
like, predatory too. I'm like, okay, like I, I just want to post my flyer. Like sometimes you'll do uh, a slideshow of like landscapes and it, it'll just like not get as many likes as like a full body pic, you know? Mm -hmm. So like having a magazine like that, like really puts your stuff into a better place for people mm -hmm. to see it and like respect it despite a shitty algorithm. And I think that's that's really cool what you were saying before about kind of like the difference between moving individually and moving as a community mm -hmm. and how like that unity <coughs> makes it, it like feels so much more valid and it feels like it has so much more impact. Um, and mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, you came out with this project pretty recently. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how long you've been working on it, but at least like since we've been aware of it, it's it's been pretty recent and already it's making like a huge impact. Oh, thank you. Um, and yeah, that end, end of thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually to answer your curiosity, it began in January is when I had first start of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then I released it this month, the first edition. So I have like two editions like ready to go. So I'm like a, one edition ahead. Good. So like this next one will come out in November and like every three months it'll keep coming out. But then um, in between, I'd like to start doing like events. Um, in my first edition, I highlight community fridges and I would like an event to be like, cool. let's fill a community fridge together. You know what I mean? Like, so it's things that are beyond the magazine. The magazine is like a way to capture people who are interested in food culture. And then I can like, you know, pr like engage them to like, oh, let's, you know, do something impactful when it comes to food deserts here in Miami, which is another passion of mine is like uncovering that. How can mm -hmm. I help that? How can I bring light to that? Um, food insecurity and stuff like that. So um, just different events, different videos. You know, I wanted to like the magazine is definitely the main thing, but I wanted to go beyond that as well. That's right. great because you're building community and then now you're able to mobilize that community mm -hmm. exactly. for good. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you think about the food scene overall? Thank you, love. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> yes. Uh, production assistant Nick, everybody. <laughs> um, so my question for you is, I don't know how much experience you have with other food scenes in different cities, but what is your opinion of the food scene here in Miami? Um, because I feel like not a lot of people really think about going to Miami for the food specifically. I, but like, I, I think a lot of residents here, not, not everybody, but a lot of residents here do see the value of like the, the sort of variety and the richness of the, food, of the cuisine that you can find out here. Yeah. I mean, when people think of Miami, what's the first food people think about? Cuban sandwiches, <laughs> la colada, la croqueta. But Cubans aren't the only culture that are here in Miami. So I think that's what's the most important thing to, to think about is that we have a lot of neighborhoods in Miami right now that are being super gentrified, being super pushed out to have these like Brickle-esque sort of like club restaurants sort of vibe, you know, which is kind of shitty. So it's like, I'm trying to really put a fire up everyone's ass. I don't know if I can curse, but you can uh, okay. <laughs> I think it's funny that like people like, always ass. think that we can't curse here. <laughs> Okay. I'm like, can I? Uh, I don't know if it'll be bleeped. No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, like trying to like take advantage of us being able to appreciate those sort of restaurants before they're pushed out. Because a mm -hmm. lot of like those sort of homegrown sort of restaurants are being pushed out. So mm -hmm. I think um, cities like New York or California will highlight like the hole in the wall places and like highlight them also in different ways, more creative ways. Like I do see a lot of like graphic designers making like obscure little like flyers for them mm -hmm. or like even like, oh, this person has been, you know, working at this place for 50 years and like they're, they want to retire um, and like it's little, little ice cream shop and like just that little reel line out the door yeah and I'm like that's what I want to do like I want to like mm -hmm. find these places that have been here for a while or even places that are like newer but they're just like you know locals they're like trying their hardest they're even more so if they're highlighting a culture that's not Cuban or not a club restaurant um a club restaurant <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that no, term no. Club restaurant. <laughs> well club restaurant is <laughs> a restaurant that's like a club yeah. right so yeah. it's like a lot of loud music it's really dark the food's very expensive it's shitty the cocktail program is probably good but uh -huh. it's like one of those places so um <laughs> um but yeah so I think um 
highlighting Miami food culture in that sort of way is really important to me because I want to try to preserve it as much as we can before it gets, you know, either engulfed in water or pushed into <laughs> gentrification. <laughs> very true. Yeah, very true. Um, I, I know that you kind of like already answered this question, but it, it just occurred to me that it would be like good to, to ask this question because maybe um, somebody would come to you and say something like, you know, what is the difference between what you do and sort of like the foodie blogs that you see on Instagram reels, like the, the food influencers that just go around and they like, you know, show a little bit about like how the food is made and then they do like, they just like show videos of, of them eating it. Like, I think it's, I think it's a little bit overdone. I like, I do appreciate that, that sort of content and I do support that as a way of, of living. I think it's really cool. And it is something that I had wanted for a bit as well. But then I started thinking, I'm like, the amount of, like, you see that one person, then you see, like, 50 plates of food. I'm like, there's no way that they're eating all of that. <laughs> like, what are they doing with all this extra food, you know? And uh -huh. I'm like, is it going to waste? Like, who's eating it? Like, what's going on? Like, a lot of those questions kind of made me feel a little bit guilty about, like, supporting that. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, that's what I mean. Like, it's, I just feel like it's just so repetitive. Like, they go to the restaurant, they eat, they leave, and that's it. And I'm like, I'm kind of, like, left wanting more. Like, I want to know, again, like, who's cooking it? Like, you know, what's the cultural significance of this play? Like, what does it mean to the, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. just so many questions start popping up and I'm like, I want to see other kinds of content. Even if it's the influencer cooking something, you know right. what I mean? Like, I do see certain, um, like, for example, Fat Girl Hedonist, who she started off doing these sort of blogs where she's reviewing food, but she also has, like, a blog where she has recipes, like, from her own culture. And I'm like, yeah. that's cool, like, having that sort of balance. But I think sometimes food influencers can be, like, really, really excessive. And they also sh highlight the same sort of spots, too. Mm -hmm. It's, like, the same sort of restaurants. So I'm seeing the same restaurants. I'm seeing the same food. I'm like, okay, I'm, like, really bored, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and everyone ordering the same sort of things. I'm like, okay, like, I'm tired of seeing the Nutella French toast. Like, I'm tired of <laughs> seeing the tartars. Like, give me something new, please. So that's what I'm trying to, like, showcase as well. It's like, we're not just this. Yeah. Something that you mentioned in the magazine that I really loved um, was the idea of like third spaces and food oh, as a catalyst for change. Love that. Um, yes, um, because I feel like, you know, we're in a day and age where it's really difficult for people to talk to one another yeah. and it's really difficult to see eye to eye on a lot of things. But w one thing is for sure, we all eat. We yeah. eat every single we're day, hungry. three yeah. times a day. Hopefully. At least. Hopefully. <laughs> should be eating every yeah. day. <laughs> Please. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to hear, like, if you had any thoughts on, like, what the, you know, to step away from, like, the food bloggers and just, like, recreating, regurgitating this content. Like, what could be what we do with food? Like, how can food really change the dynamic or be really a catalyst for change? I think it's just allowing your curiosity to, to like come to you like allow it to come to you like if you are curious like hmm, how do you make this or where did this come from or what um cultural influences this have like um how do you make it like anything that that is beyond just like eating it um and even if you are eating it like kind of describing a little bit more than just being like it's so good you know what i mean like describing the flavors the textures the balance like what does it need like critiquing it like having like a kind of like a fuller sort of conversation but all of that falls into being present i mean how many times do you go to a restaurant and everyone's on their phone maybe mm -hmm. you yourself have even gone with someone and they're like on their phone it's like mm -hmm. you know we're here we're present like if you're not present you're not going to be able to enjoy the food on another level than right. just being like it's good you know so that's something too. that's really interesting um because in my mind, it kind of ties back to, I think, the overall culture that we see a lot here in the United States, that it's a culture of consumption. Yeah. And kind of what you're doing is saying, like, hey, hold on. It, it, let's, Slow down. Let's think about what we're consuming. Yeah. Like, let's get behind just just the product. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in of itself is, is definitely a catalyst. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, when I, uh, I can't wait to see more of Underbelly and the events that you are going to be putting together and just everything that you have going on. So make sure to follow Swan Eye on Instagram, uh, Swan, uh, Underbelly on Instagram, and get yourself a copy when the current one and when the next one comes out yeah let's yes. get every copy yes <laughs> so um and look out for those events and look out yeah yes for definitely want to go to those out. events <laughs> i'll let you know i'll let you know
All right. Well, we'll have you on for the other segment. Yes. So perfect. Um, Thank now, you. Now we're going to invite over Safania. Safania. Of Maroon Isles production. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, my hello. love. Welcome. <laughs> hello, hello. It's great to be here. <laughs> great to have you. Great to have you. Looks spiffy. Oh, thank Looking you. I good. decided if I'm going to be immortalized on the internet, I have to put on a good shirt. So. Yeah. Good shirt. No, at the very least. At the very least. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Gladney and I are always thinking about our podcast outfits. It's We're true, like, oh, we need to go thrifting because, you know, the looks are stale. <laughs> 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 it's a good excuse. It's a good excuse. <laughs> um, but yeah. All right. First question. Who is Safania? And also, what is Maroon Isles production? Oh, those are two questions. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the first question, my name is Safania Richard Gallen. I am the third of four children. I was born in Miami-Dade, Florida. Um, but when I was like eight years old, I had to move back to my, my parents' country of origin, Suriname in South America. Mm-hmm. I grew up there, and I came back to Miami for my studies in theater. Um, since then, I... When did you move back? I'm sorry to cut you off. I moved back in 2016. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I moved back in 2016. So I think I've been living here, what, how many years is that? Like seven? Is that seven years? Wow. Almost seven years now. Um, it's been a very exciting journey. I have learned, I had to relearn American customs. I had to like relearn how to speak English because when I moved back here, everybody was speaking this kind of like um, slang. Like I didn't know what a whip was. I didn't know. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I was like so good. I, was, I remember like, no, no, no. I used to work at Panera Bread, right? And I remember uh, I was out of work and I was listening to two of my coworkers talk and they were using like I guess Miami slang and I didn't understand a single word they were saying. Not a single word. And I looked up to this person across the table, I'm like, are they speaking English? And <laughs> they looked at me like I grew a third head or something. So it's been a journey since I moved back to Miami. That's so funny. The the irregardless, the pero likes. Like I didn't speak Spanish. We don't speak Spanish yeah. in my country. So I'm like all this Spanish. I'm like, oh it's a, it was like a little bit of a culture shock. Yeah. Um, where once I got to used to the culture of Miami, it just turned out to be more familiar, just literally speaking a different language. But the same intonations, the same um, and relationships, they still exist. It's just learning how they translate into America. Mm-hmm. So That's really interesting. That's a really cool perspective. Um, and then I know, like you came, you said that you were co- um, coming here to study theater. And what was that like? Oh, that was a journey. Um, um, They have a very hard time with international students, any program, because they charge they charge out of state students like three times the tuition of an in state student. And if you're international, they charge you even more. Um, I was lucky enough that I was born a U.S. citizen, but because I had been living here um, Mm -hmm. for a couple years, I don't have a a U.S. degree. They want to charge me out of state fees, which is, again, three times as much. And if you come here without your parents just to study school, just to study theater, right, doesn't have a lot of grants and scholarship opportunities, then I had I had to, like, get a job. I had to work. I had to get promoted. It's a whole thing. I even wrote, like, a mini play about it, like the experience of just working in the restaurant industry, trying to support yourself, help out your family and trying to make it like in the world. Right. Um, but eventually, I was um, blessed enough to go to Miami-Dade North Campus for about two years. I met wonderful professors that set me on the right track. And my theater professor, who was an alumni of New World School of the Arts, um, sent me <laughs> to New World School of the Arts. That He actually sent me to the theater conference, the so- South Florida Theater Conference, where I got invited back to audition for New World, which I did. And then I got in on a scholarship. Nice. So, yeah, it was a great, one of the best three years of my life in college. Um, and I recently graduated last, last, last year, last spring. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> that was it was tough. The Zoom year. That <laughs> the pandi- Zoom year. The zo- the zo- no, I lived that too. I lived that the too. The Zoom year. I almost wanted to quit. But I'm like, if I quit now, when will I go back to school? And yeah. I'm only getting older, right? Like yeah. all, you, all you do in life is age. <laughs> that, must have so, that must have been so hard, like theater over Zoom. So you like know an what? extra layer. No, I, I have like very specific um, <laughs> to, like experience in this because I feel like arts majors like during that time was so weird because I studied visual arts and my last year was also over Zoom and it was just so strange. <laughs> so strange. Because How do you act to someone who has like a two five like two to five second delay? I remember I got a note from my dean at the time and she was like, Safania, it seems like you're pausing before you react. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm reacting as soon as my 
my my Zoom tells me they're done speaking. And my professor's like, you need to anticipate them speaking. I'm like, no one ever does that. You don't do that in the real acting world. You hear what they say, and then you say something back. And it's like live. Because acting is just imitation of life. But you haven't want me to imitate life with this machine that is a little bit too old to be having all these hardware processes <laughs> and video. Like, it's not clean. The sound isn't good. It asked me to buy lights. It was all... I do not miss that year. I, no. The silence the silence was nice because theater kids could be loud and it allowed me to focus on the textual, like <laughs> the, the actual textbook work of everything. But that communication, that, that, that um, getting up on your feet and working with people, yeah, we really kind of suffered because of that. Yeah. But I persevered, I graduated, and I started my own company. So hey, anything Ooh. is possible as long as you have determination, right? Absolutely. That's wonderful. And, and um, just quick question for you, because like since you were you were talking about how like everything that you had gone through because you were so interested in making this this dream of being involved in the theater industry alive. What drew you to theater in the first place? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I laugh because like the story is funny to me. I don't know. Maybe it's funny to you. <laughs> I was 13 years old. Like, you know, 13 year old kids, mm -hmm. they have insecurities, they have fears, they, don't, they have doubts. Um, they get bullied. You know, everybody and their mother's been bullied at this point. But um, I was in a point in my life where I'm like, you know what? Maybe it would be better if I don't exist. I am having non-existence thoughts. So I'm like, huh. But one day my mom was watching uh, Medea. Yeah. Okay. Medea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was the movie. I think it was the Diary of a Mad Black Woman, uh -huh. where Medea is telling telling her. I don't know what the words are ex exactly. I just remember the impact. But it was along the lines of like, you can't let these people beat you. If you let these people beat you, then you will lose your life that you have and everything that you can work for and aspire to. None of those things will exist. And I sat there and I'm like, huh. In uh, one day I will wake up and I'll be in a position where I want to be. I'll be living the life that I, I want to have and I'll be talking to people I want to be around. Like when you're young, a lot of the decisions in your life aren't made by you. They're made by your parents. They're made by authority figures. They're made by teachers. They're made by uncles. They're made by grandparents. Um, but I just told myself at that young age, oh, because I was inspired by this movie of a black man, 6'2", six, 6'3", six, in a big old wig, wearing drag, which is right. not being banned in Florida, um, wearing drag, that life is worth living, I want to be able to inspire people with my art to do the same thing. So ever since then, ever since I was 13 years old, I've been pursuing like acting and theater and just the arts in general because of the impact it had on my life. That's a really cool story. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> I think it's still cringe. It's cringy. <laughs> What well, cringe. No, I, I loved it. Like, that's incredible that, you know, a, a piece of art, like, you know, even though it's it's not like very well known for its profoundity, like it, it's it was exactly the message that you needed to hear. Yes, and yes. How it just like catapulted you on this completely other, uh, a complete other journey, like a complete other path in your life. That's that's really, really cool. And how we don't know, like how much of an impact our art and the things that we create will have. Like, we can't really speculate, you know? No, you can't. You can't really, uh, uh, like, ever assess the magnitude that art has on a culture. And that's the beautiful thing about culture. So, like, you asked me earlier why I started Maroon Isle Productions. Uh, Maroon Isle LLC has two parts, the production side and the art side. All of it is to encapsulate, encapsulate the experience of my ancestors, the Maroon people. Um, if you don't know, the Maroon people are Africans, groups of Africans in the Caribbean and South America who decided slavery wasn't for them. Um, they're going to war against the, the, the colonialists that, that, uh, that enslaved them. And they won. And they won some of their freedoms back and were able to live in peace in, um, in their distinct regions. There's like three. They're the Haitian Maroons, they're the uh, Jamaican Maroons, and the Surinamese Maroons. And I'm descended from the Surinamese Maroons. So my grandmother never went to school. She didn't know how to read and write because she was living outside of the city like the mm -hmm. the industrial civilized world mm -hmm. but it was my parents who were able to like go to school and my parents brought me to the united states um so 
Maroon Isles, in in a sense, is that island, that 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 the happy, this promised land, this this place where our culture can live and exist, and these people can be free and to tell their stories here, along with anybody who's ever gone through those experiences themselves. So yeah, I've started with writing my own stories for Maroon Isles Productions. You recently saw Jealousy. I had a lot of fun doing that, but that also balanced what I want to bring to my table as an immigrant, and what also exists here in Miami. So right. the production side is not only to like bring forward our culture into like the world into not, not saying the mainstream but to be known and not forgotten but also to invite people so we can start telling our stories together um so yeah our jealousy <laughs> i'm talking about jealousy is the only production i've done so far but a lot of a lot of the fun i had with it was adapting this uh, 17th century play written by this french european for uh the kings and monarchs and aristocrats of the day in order to get fed and i'm like okay he made his living serving the elites i can make my living serving the people so i took one of his 15 minute short plays and i turned it into like a uh, almost 2 hour long experience uh -huh. featuring a local Local actors featuring stories influenced by their own stories and the stories about people here in Miami um, who here hasn't been afraid that their lover has been cheating on them um, who hasn't had cultural differences with a partner if they're from a different race or a different country you, you guys might both be Latino but if one's from Cuba and one's from Puerto Rico something will be different <laughs> um, it, you're gonna have you're gonna have your issues uh, and it was uh, going through the different kinds of relationship issues we can have here in Miami, but also understanding ultimately that what res resolves the peace is communication, clear, yeah. open communication about one's wants, one's needs, one's insecurities, so that we can go on this journey of life together. That's so funny because that that was the resolution of your play. That was how like everything kind of like resolved itself at the end once like they were able to communicate what it was that was actually bothering them. Right. But how often in our own personal lives do we have a whole bunch of unresolved trauma, unresolved issues, like holding resentment and you're not allowed, allowed you're never able to get that closure from someone because they refuse to communicate with you. Like maybe you might be open yourself to that, that opening that door, but they refuse to do it. And you know, the savage culture, like it, it, it has its place. But if you want lasting relationships and build a community, mm -hmm. communication and comprehension, you know, because you have to understand each right. other too. Mm -hmm. I can't be shouting at you because shouting is communication, right? But are you going to understand what I'm saying to you if I'm shouting at you? Yeah. If I'm screaming, if I'm throwing things, like if I'm if I'm having an emotional outburst, however justified. Um, Which also happened at jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we made it real. Yeah. I, I told. I told. I told the actors uh, specifically not to think of the show as a comedy because once you think of a show as a comedy they're gonna be doing these things to make people laugh but what's funny about these situations is how absurd they are yeah when mm -hmm. they're happening as they're happening yeah but i'm pretty sure if you took two steps back from the argument you're having about hair on the bar of soap um you would see how <laughs> ridiculous you're arguing <laughs> is about hair being on the bar of soap but like it's so important for people mm -hmm. to have have their voices heard and to be understood right so it makes sense why these arguments happen we just have to get better as people navigating them um, I'm going to ask you this question because we're going to run out of time and I want you to be able to talk about this. Okay. So your next production coming up. Oh, yes. yes. It's really interesting. You've already explained to me a little bit about the synopsis uh, and you have a Kickstarter for it so that people can, can you know, support, support yes. and make this happen. Yes, um, this art exists for the community. Um, I bring like storytellers, playwrights, um, lyricists, songwriters. We all make things for people to enjoy. And part of my journey as a playwright is to preserve the culture of the Maroon people, um, to reflect the world and its problems to the people that they live in and inhabit it, and to have fun. Jealousy was all those three things. Oscunero, even more so. Mm -hmm. It is, at the moment, my magnum opus. I will say that. I put the most amount of effort into it. It is the story about three, Af four African children who get thrust into slavery um, and the choices and decisions that they had to make because they were thrust into slavery. Um, it's supposed to um, mirror the experience of every one of the African diaspora who has been traumatized by the, by the, by the kidnapping that happened in Africa hundreds of years ago and that cultural reset that had to happen. Uh, part of the greatest tragedy of the slave trade has been the cultural genocide. Um, and a lot of people like to downplay that. But I like to, to put into like the Western world's terms, if we burn 
the Notre Dame. When the Notre Dame burned down, the entire world cried. Mm -hmm. If if the Mona Lisa gets stolen and destroyed, people will turn and cry. If if the Roman Colosseum, Colosseums, Colosseums, <laughs> the little Colosseums over there in, in in Rome, if they fall down tomorrow, people will feel a loss of history. Now imagine doing that to an entire people you you've taken from their homes, taken from their continent, taken from their villages, and brought them to this side of the world. Um, I am blessed enough to be born into a, a tribe, a culture of people who've managed to retain a lot of their cultures and traditions throughout the generations and haven't had that had that erased. Mm -hmm. And Oscar Nero talks about their experiences, talks about their journeys, talks about their struggles, where they had to even fight against their own brothers and sisters to cement their freedom. And it's, it's a crazy scenario when you think about it. It's someone coming in the middle of the night, taking you from your home and making you plant sugar cane? Like for money and they don't even know your name they don't even care to know your name yeah. you're just numbers and your profit and your margins and it's just all capitalism yeah. at the end of the day we, we i want to i want to cut it and, and shape it in a, in a different form so we understand not from oh slavery was bad i'm like no these are people we are people everyone are people and if we don't understand that African stories are human stories. The Indonesian stories are human stories. The, the Latino stories are human stories. And, and we're just telling stories about the human experience and how we as humans have wronged each other and we we'll make these wrongs right, then we're, we're at a severe disadvantage. So if you, sorry, <laughs> if you want to support this project and hear more stories like this, then uh, jump on my Kickstarter. It's in my, it's in my bio. I believe I'm like linked on their page. <laughs> so any support, if you cannot uh, physically donate any amount, um, then just share it, talk about it. Um, the thing, the way things die is that we don't talk about them anymore. Mm -hmm. The way we lose lessons is by not talking about our shared history and the shared lessons that we have and what we expect and hope for the future. Um, a great a great power that storytellers have is that you're able to present a future where we may live. Right now I'm focused on the past with Oscar Nero and, and some other projects, but in Jealousy, I have that lesson there too. Like, what mm -hmm. will our future be if we just communicate and understand? What will our future be if we actually look back and remember? What will our future be if we as a culture and a society actively choose to be better and don't fight against all the advancements that we've made in the past 60 years, 100 years, 300 years as a society. That's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and it makes That's me great. really, really want to, to see this play. Yeah, Yeah. no, yeah. I'm so excited I'm about so it. Excited. And we're actually going to be seeing like a short clip of it, not clip, sorry, but a short part of it um, on September 24th, El Igor y Sus Panas. Stefania will be performing a bit of Oscunero there, so that would be a really great way to, to catch a sneak peek of this incredible production. Yeah, we're gonna be doing the first, uh, the first scene of the play where it introduces two titular characters. You're gonna, it starts very funny. We like to see relationships and family because mm -hmm. that's how we connect, right? Mm -hmm. You're gonna come see the two villagers of Ensuo Efi, uh, mm -hmm. Akosua and Saida, and Akosua is slacking on his chores. Let's see how Saida gets him to get back to work. <laughs> oh, that's All so right. exciting. Um, but we must move on. If you want to see more of Stefania's work, definitely follow him. Um, Void, it's Zoid. Zef Void. Z Zef Void, yes. And then Maroon Isles Production yes. on Instagram. On Instagram. But don't go anywhere because we have one more segment for you. So we're going to ask Swane of Underbelly back for our new um, segment. Hay comida en casa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where we talk about the food that we've been eating lately that we love and we can't stop thinking about. Have you ever, like, had your, uh, like, when you're growing up here in Miami and you're like, oh, I want to I wanna go to McDonald's, I want to go to Burger King, whatever, and then, like, you get the response, like, hay comida en casa. Yeah. It's kind of that idea where, like, you know, forget the chains. No, there's, like, here, like, really great food in South Florida. Yeah. Like, from local restaurants so I comida en casa um first uh definitely we want to ask one because you know expert so yeah, <laughs> yeah like, sounds like sounds about right <laughs> um so your question is what places I like to go to what locally are recently recs? what yeah. are your recs tell us hmm okay so my one of my favorite favorite restaurants in Miami is called Kung Chow um which is a, a dim sum restaurant on bird um, I recently tried, I usually only stick to the dim sum menu, but recently I went 
off it and I ordered Mongolian beef and it was like the best Mongolian beef I've ever had in my life. Like the steak was so tender, had like good veggies, a good balance of like savory, a little bit sweet with like the white rice. It was phenomenal. But also a new spot that I really like is called Tam Tam. Um, yes, which yes. is in downtown and actually the person who wrote the third places uh, article that you mentioned earlier he works at Tam Tam he's one of the chefs there oh nice yeah yeah um, I had their like special it was like a duck curry with like some noodles and it was like I don't really eat spicy food Cubans don't believe in spicy food <laughs> like my mom will put a little bit of black pepper in something she's like mm, ta picante and it's like <laughs> it's just black pepper um, so, <laughs> so I was really like sweating I was going through it eating it but it was super worth it so I would say those two places and, and Tam Tam like just opened a physical location i think right right in front of the courthouse wow yeah it's a good view that's cool i guess that's cool <laughs> it's uh it's um thai food right it's a uh, vietnamese vietnamese mm -hmm. okay. okay yeah i yeah. definitely need to try it out yeah yeah like you won't find like a banh mi on their menu like they're really like traditional sort of dishes that you might not have seen anywhere else so and they do their own spin they get a lot of like fresh produce uh, i'm a huge fan they have karaoke in the bathroom <laughs> what <laughs> yeah they have karaoke it's like a karaoke is like a big like part of vietnamese like culture so like they have right before the bathroom they have a huge tv and you can like do karaoke there. oh okay i thought yeah. you meant in yeah. the bathroom yeah. in the bathroom but in like you open bathroom. the bathroom and there's like a huge tv and then like the toilet's right there <laughs> yeah <laughs> right i mean something if you want to do you know why not that's it's a good way to pass time <laughs> do a little karaoke in bathroom. yeah <laughs> what's taking up so long karaoke <laughs> <laughs> I love karaoke, so. But yeah, those two places I recommend, Kong Chao and, and Tam Tam. That's so funny. I literally just came from Dim Sum because I was uh, meeting with my, my dad. Uh, he just came back from, from Las Vegas and my family was at um, a Dim Sum restaurant, Tropical Chinese. Dim Tropical oh, Chinese. Don't open that book Road. right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a huge rivalry in Miami of Tropical Chinese versus Kong Chao. No way. Yeah, I'm team Kong Chao all the way. I'm wow. not team Oh my Tropical God. Chinese. No, you got to go to Tropical Chinese for, is good. to the tea. For it's the good. Tea, Tropical Chinese is good, but for me, Kung Chao, they have like these green tea duck dumplings that like I'm like loyal to. I love Kung Chao. And I also like that they like make everything fresh. Like, because in Tropical Chinese, it's a little cart, right? When you went, uh -huh. was it like that? The little well, cart? I, no. no. Oh, okay. I was, I, I only stayed for like one course because I had the podcast, but. <laughs> oh, they're both good, but I'm definitely yeah. team Kung Chao. It's like a huge like debate here. Yeah. Okay, so I, that's that's one of mine because I I mean I just had the chicken dumplings they were good fresh in my mind. Also, Sufrat is another one that's mm. on Pines Boulevard, oh. and uh, it's like it's so good. It's so Sufrat. so good. It's it's like very accessible, very like it's it doesn't take that so much time to prepare, but just like absolutely mm. mouthwatering and delicious. And then parody, of course, like you can't mm. really go wrong with parody. Parody. <laughs> parody. Good third place. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a good th like yes. a place where people can like communicate and like they do a lot of really cool events um great food now they're not doing pizza though yeah do you no see about pizza. that what no happened? pizza no more pizza no more no. pizza but their menu their full menu is on the entire day so yeah. that's how they're doing different things which yeah. is cool and they're yeah. venturing out yeah. but yeah. i won't they're miss their pizza what works for them but cry yeah, yeah. they said they'd bring it back some at some special events so yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. uh, what about you, Spania? Um, I'm not a um, food magazine expert, like Swan <laughs> over here. Um, so I'm going to have one place I'm going to mention. I'm going to mention Thank You Miami. Uh, oh, so cute. Thank You Miami is amazing. Yeah. Um, Alex, who runs it, is uh, he used to run a food truck, mm -hmm. um, but now he opened his restaurant location. It's been open for like a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. um, I think this December is going to make two years. Uh, he has the pb and Jelly mm -hmm. Burger. Oh. That I, I always get it with um, the sweet potato fries. Ooh, yeah. And it's his origi original uh, recipe. It is to die for. I love it. Wow. I get it every single time. Their food truck was peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, peanut butter. Yeah, it was peanut butter and jelly. Then he yeah. transitioned. He sold it. I believe he sold the food truck and he yeah. opened his business. He said it was terrified to do it. But like, if he, I, I, you, I know you've been there. I, he hosts events. He does tons he of things. Does. He has yeah. karaoke open night, mics. which open I host. Mics. I'm a karaoke DJ, oh, if you didn't know, with karaoke what? and karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do that every Wednesday. We're about to move to Thursdays. <laughs> Um, there's also comedy nights. It's Mondays and Fridays. He has special events on Saturdays. I believe tonight he's having a live band in the space. Cool. And we're going to sing. And he also does um, inter immersive dinner theater experiences, courtesy wow. of me. Uh, <laughs> if you see, uh, if you go to his bathroom, 
this. Oh, bathroom. another cool bathroom. Another cool, <laughs> another cool, cool bathroom. bathroom. That's if true. you go into his bathroom, <laughs> it is covered with CDs from the, t- uh, the early 2000s. Yeah. Oh my god! Whether it's uh, movies, your favorite comedy, action cool. movies like Die Hard, he always has Ace Ventura playing on the TV yeah, that's in the it. bathroom. But the that's TV so in that silly. bathroom too. Uh, it's literally a stack of DVD boxes. Yes. Interesting. I'm ta- yeah, and the TV's right there. So, like, I remember when he installed it. I, like, I was working in the bathroom. I just started watching the movie. I'm like, I'm, and I heard somebody knock on the door. I'm like, oh, somebody's DJ. Let me get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you are local, if you're in Little Havana on 1701 West Blackguard Street, uh, there is Thank You Miami. And they are great. They have their own mixed cocktails. Mm-hmm. Um, Luciano, the bartender, is great. Andre, oh, Andres, who works behind there, is also great. He's one of the chefs there. Um, it's just a great place to hang and vibe. He has like he has like Hyaliaopoly. He also has Monopoly. He also has Kendallopoly. I didn't even know they made these things, but he <laughs> has so them. Cool. He also can play Jenga. Like he he even has a video game where you can play like 1990s like oh. Sega games. You can play Mario, oh, cool. I think. Um, Mario Kart. It's it's crazy. Like he has so many things going on there that every single time I go in for my shift, I'm just looking around. Yeah. I'm like, there are the bobbleheads. There's Darth Vader. There's the, there's the Hyaliaopoly. Now I'm in the bathroom staring at everything <laughs> Ventura. Like if you want I a good it. time and some great food great food too that's so funny i really hope that he gives you a free pb and j burger for the school <laughs> he got yeah. you there. <laughs> <laughs> dj karaoke <laughs> some theater a little bit of he's gonna make you cook next yo <laughs> what no, 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 be, be behind there making this pb and j burger he's like you like it so much so far come on make it make it All right, babe, your turn. Um, one really good, great bar um, that's actually very much fun like that is 10th Level Tavern. It's in Oakland Park, um, and they have um, video games everywhere. So you can play Leonardo you know, Mario Kart and Super Smash Bros. Um, but I do want to plug, shameless plug, El Bayou de Abuela Sara in um, Hollywood. It's a Puerto Rican restaurant that has incredible mofongo. Ooh. Yeah, like so good. It's so good. Interesting. Yeah. So them. those are my yeah. You can't go wrong with platanos. I was gonna say like platanos, so multifunctional. Yeah. Platanos, tostones. Yeah. Oof. Maduros, plantains, arepas. I can go on. Yeah. Tamales for sure. Tamales. Yeah. Tamales. I, I know. Eat yeah. Here. yeah. Like, I need to go, go eat. We need to go eat something. Dang. I'm starving actually. All right. This has been I Comida en Casa. To submit your questions or to submit like ideas for the upcoming shows, please reach out to us at Panamia Club. Yes. Yes. Dale mi gente. Y con eso, we conclude this live episode of Panavision. Join us uh, next next week <laughs> to learn more. The 16th. Um, the 16th yeah. to learn about more creatives and organizations, entrepreneurs working to change their communities. All right. Goodbye. Yes, bye. 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 Follow us on, on, subscribe to our YouTube. Bye. Bye.